My father was, he is on the left here, my father was officer of the general staff of the Soviet army. He was inspector of land forces, Soviet troops stationed in countries like Mongolia, Cuba, East European countries. This is the picture taken at the entrance of my Institute of Oriental Languages. It's a part of Moscow State University. As every Soviet student, I was, quote unquote, volunteering for harvesting grain in Kazakhstan. By the end of my training in school, I was recruited by the KGB. This picture was taken on that day, and you can see again how happy it feels to be recruited by the KGB. Pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. One of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. In 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine. A group of 12 people arrived to USSR from the United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October Socialist Revolution in my country. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies. Our conversation is with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov. Mr. Bezmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. One of his interesting assignments was to brainwash foreign diplomats when they visited Moscow. And he'll tell us a little bit about how they did this and how they planted information which eventually wound up in the press of the free world. He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. Mr. Bezmianov, I'd like to begin by having you tell us a little bit about some of your childhood memories. Well, the most vivid memory of my childhood was Second World War, or to be more precise, the end of the Second World War, when all of a sudden the United States, from a friendly uh, nation, which helped us to defeat Nazism, turned overnight into a, a deadly enemy. And it was very shocking because uh, all newspapers were trying to present an image of belligerent, aggressive American imperialism. Most of the things that we were taught is that the United States is aggressive power, which is just about to invade our beautiful free socialist country, uh, that American CIA is dropping Colorado beetles on our beautiful potato fields, to eliminate our crops. And each schoolboy had a, a picture of Colorado bug on the, on the back page of his notebook. And we were instructed to go into collective fields to search for those little Colorado bugs. Of course, we couldn't find any. Neither we could find ma many potatoes. And that was explained again by the encroachments of the decadent imperialist power. Um, the anti-American paranoia, hysteria in, in the Soviet propaganda was to such an, uh, of such a higher degree uh, that many less skeptical people or less stubborn would really believe that the United States is just about to invade our beautiful motherland and some secretly hope that it will come true. That's interesting. Yes. Well, getting back to uh, life inside the Soviet Union or inside communist countries in general, in this country, uh, at the university level primarily, we read and hear that uh, the Soviet system is different from ours, but not that different, and that there is a convergence uh, developing between all of the systems of the world, and that really doesn't make an awful lot of difference what system you live under, because you have corruption and dishonesty and tyranny and all that sort of thing. From your personal experience, what is the difference between life under communism and life in the United States? Well, life is obviously very much different for, for simple reason that uh, the Soviet Union is a state capitalist economically. It's a state capitalism 
where an individual has absolutely no rights, no value, his life is nothing, it's just like an insect. He is disposable, whereby in the United States even the, the, even the worst criminal is treated as a human being, he has a fair trial, and some of them capitalize on their crimes, they, they publish their memoirs in their prisons, and uh, get handsomely paid by your crazy publishers. Uh, the uh, differences, of course, in the daily life are very various, uh, depending on who whom we are talking about. In my own private life, I never suffered from communism simply because I was brought up in a family of high-ranking military officer. Uh, most of the doors were open for me. Most of my expenses were paid by the government, and I never had any troubles in, uh, with the authorities or, or with the police. So, in other words, I, I would say I, I enjoyed, or I had good reasons to enjoy all the advantages of so-called socialist uh, system. Mm -hmm. My main uh, motivations to defect was, had nothing to do with affluence. It was mainly moral indignation, moral protest, rebellion against the inhuman methods of, of the Soviet system. Well, specifically, what did you object to? I objected, first of all, against oppression of my own dissidents and intellectuals. And that was the most disgusting thing that, that I witnessed as a, as a young man, young student, who was brought up a, a very troublesome period in our history, from Stalin to Khrushchev, from total tyranny and oppression to some kind of liberalization. Second, when I started working for the Soviet embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind. That my country brings to India not freedom, progress, and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation, and slavery, and, and, and of course economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which by KGB standards is an extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty. When an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country, I literally fell in love with this beautiful country, a country of great contrasts, but also great humility, great tolerance, and, and if philosophical and intellectual freedoms. My ancestors used to live in caves and eat raw meat when India was a highly civilized nation 6,000 years ago. So obviously the choice was not to the advantage of my own nation. I decided to defect and to entirely dissociate myself from that brutal regime. Mr. Besmianov, uh, we've read a lot about the concentration camps and the slave labor camps under the Stalin regime. Now the general impression in America is that those things are part of the past. Are they still going on today, or what is the yes. status? Yes. There is no qualitative change in, in the Soviet concentration camp system. Uh, there are changes in, in numbers of prisoners. Again, this is uh, un unreliable Soviet statistics. We don't know how many political prisoners are there in the Soviet concentration camps. But we sure know from, from various sources that at each uh, particular time there are close to uh, 25 to 30 million of Soviet citizens who are virtually kept as slaves in forced labor camp system. The size of the population of a uh, country like Canada is serving terms as, as prisoners. Incredible. So um, I would say that those intellectuals who try to convince American public that concentration camp system is a thing of a past are either conscientiously misleading public opinion or they are not in very intellectual people. They, they're selectively blind. They, don't, they lack um, intellectual honesty when they say that. Well, we've spoken about the intellectuals in this country and also the intellectuals in the Soviet Union. What about down at the broad mass level? Do the people in general, the, worker, the working people, the workers in general in the Soviet Union, do they support the system? Do they tolerate it? What is their attitude? Well, average Soviet citizen, if there is such an animal, of course, does not like the system because it hurts, it kills. 
he may not understand the the reasons. He, he may not have enough information or or educational background to understand. Uh, but I doubt very much there are many people who are uh, conscientiously supporting the Soviet system. There are not such such people in USSR. Even those who have all the reasons to enjoy socialism, people like myself, who were a member of journalistic elite, uh, they they also hate the system for, for different reasons, though. Not because they lack material affluence, but because they are unfree to think, they are in constant fear, duplicity, split personality. And this is the greatest tragedy for my nation. Well, what do you think are the chances of the people actually overcoming their system or replacing it? Uh, there is a great possibility that system will sooner or later be, be destroyed from within. There is a self-destructive mechanism built in, into any socialist or communist or fascist system uh, because there is lack of feedback, because the system does not rely upon loyalty of, of population. But until, an, until this Soviet junta is being supported by the Western so-called imperialists, that is, multinational companies, establishments, governments, uh, and, let's face it, uh, intellectuals, so-called academia in the United States is famous for supporting the Soviet system. Uh, as long as the Soviet junta will keep on receiving credits, money, technology, grain deals, and political recognition from all these traitors of democracy or freedom, uh, there is no hope, there is not much hope for, for changes I in my country. And the system will not collapse by itself simply because it's, it's being nourished by so-called American imperialism. This is the greatest paradox in history of mankind when uh, capitalist world supports and actively nourishes its own destru destroyer, destructor. Hmm. I think you're trying to tell us something. Oh, in yes. This country. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to <laughs> tell you that it, it has to be stopped unless you want to end up in, in gulag system and enjoy all the advantages of socialist uh, equality. Uh, working for free, catching fleas on your body, sleeping on, on the planks of plywood in, in Alaska this time, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's where Americans will belong, unless they will wake up, of course, and force their government to stop aiding Soviet fascism. Mm -hmm. Well, you told us a moment ago why you left the system. I'd like to hear the details of how you did it. It must have been a very dangerous thing. It was not so dangerous. It was crazy. Uh, first of all, because defecting in India is virtually impossible. Thanks to very strong pressure from the Soviet government. Excuse me, you were in India, India. on assignment at yes, that time. Yes, I was working for the Soviet embassy in New Delhi as a press officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, defecting for a Soviet diplomat is next to impossible. It's a suicide, as I said, because a great friend Indira Gandhi um, pushed a law through parliament which says, and I quote, no defector from any country has a right of political asylum in any embassy on the territory of Indian Republic, which is a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but the Soviet one needs a political asylum. So knowing that perfectly well, I, I, I planned a craziest possible way to defect. I studied contraculture in India. There, are, there were thousands of young American boys and girls with no shoes, long hair, smoking hush and marijuana, studying sometimes uh, Indian philosophy, sometimes simply pretending that they study. And they greatly annoyed Indian police and they were laughing stock of Indians uh, because obviously they, they were good for nothing students. I studied carefully where they congregate, what routes they travel, what language they speak, what do they smoke. And one day I simply joined a group of hippies to avoid detection of Indian police. I was dressed as a typical hippie with uh, blue jeans, uh, long kameez shirts with all kind of nice decorations like beads, long hairs, 
I, I, I bought a wig because for several weeks I had to turn myself from a conservative Soviet diplomat into a very progressive American hippie. And <laughs> that was the only way that, that I could uh, avoid uh, detection. It was very interesting experience, uh, but it was necessary because um, from my own knowledge as a, as a member of Soviet embassy staff, I knew that there were many cases when Soviet defectors were betrayed by Indian police, and also some Western embassies played a very dirty role in betraying the Soviet defectors. According to our information, they were some I wouldn't call them double agents, but simply immoral people working for, this, uh, for the United States Embassy. And uh, confining in, in people like this would be a suicide. So I had to be extremely careful. I could not trust anyone. It, and that was, the, that was the reason for such a crazy way to defect. Well, had you been uh, caught in the act of trying to get out, what would have no. happened to you? Oh. Uh, most likely I would I end up in, in concentration camp. Uh, or, depending on the situation and on, on, the, on the whim of some bureaucrat in KGB, uh, maybe even executed, that this is normal practice. Quietly, of course, not publicly. But that would be the end of my defection, of course. Well, when did you finally make it to the United States? Uh, in 1970, after about six months of debriefing in Athens by the CIA and I presume FBI too. They let me go first to Germany, then to Canada. That was my decision. I had to change my identity to protect my family and my friends in, in USSR. And also I was a little bit paranoid uh, knowing that both Soviet KGB and probably some double agents within the American system maybe after me. So I wanted to settle down as far away as possible. Uh, I requested CIA to give me some kind of new identity and just let me go uh, on my own. And I settled in Canada. I was a student. Uh, I changed many professions from farm help and, and laundry truck driver to Instruct, language instructor and broadcaster for Canadian Broadcasting Corporations in Montreal. Well, have you had any threats on your life or any uh, yes. unpleasant Yes. Uh, in about five years, KGB eventually discovered that I am working for Canadian Broadcasting. Uh, see, I made a very big mistake. I started, talk, I started working for overseas service of CBC, which is similar to Voice of America in Russian language. And of course, uh, monitoring service in USSR picked up every new voice. Uh, every new announcer, would they, they would make it a point to discover who he is. And in five years, sure enough, slowly but surely, they discovered that I am not Thomas Schumann, that I am Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmenov, and that I am working for Canadian Broadcasting, and undermining beautiful detente between Canada and USSR. And the Soviet ambassador, Alexander Yakovlev, made it his personal effort to discredit me. He complained to Pierre Trudeau, who is known to be a little bit soft on socialism. And um, the management of CBC behaved in a very strange, cowardly way, unbecoming to representatives of an independent country like Canada. They listened to every suggestion that the Soviet ambassador gave, and they started shameful investigation, analyzing content of my broadcasts to USSR. And sure enough, they discovered that some of my statements were probably to, um, would be uh, offending to the Soviet Politburo. So I had to, to leave my, my job. And of course, subtle intimidations. They would say something like, please cross the street carefully because, you know, traffic is very heavy in Quebec. And um, fortunately, I know about the psychology and, and the logic of activity of the KGB, and I never allowed myself to be intimidated. This is the worst thing. This is what they expect a person, mm -hmm. a defector, to be intimidated. Once they spot that, that you are scared, they keep on developing that line 
-hmm. And then uh, uh, eventually you either have to give up entirely and, and, and work for them, or you, they neutralize you. They, they, they would definitely stop all kind of political activity, which they failed to do in my case, mm -hmm. because I was stubbornly working for the Canadian Broadcasting. And um, in response to their intimidations, I said that, look, this is a free country, and uh, I am as free as you are. And I also can drive very fast. And um, gun control is not yet established in Canada. So I had a couple of good shotguns in my mm. basement. So welcome to visit me someday with your Kalashnikovs machine guns. So obviously it didn't work. Intimidation didn't work. So they, they tried different approach, as I described. They approached on the highest level, on the level of Canadian bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and on that level, they were on successful. On that level, they were successful. On individual level, they failed flat. Mr. Bezmenov has brought a series of slides with him that he has taken from the Soviet Union, and I think this is a good time to uh, take a look at the slides. Yes. Now, the viewers will be able to see these slides as, as we talk about them. Yes, this okay. is a collection of slides which are, some of them are, uh, snapshots from my family album. Some of them are documents which I smuggled from the Soviet embassy. And some are reproductions from local mass media. I usually show them to establish my credibility as, mm -hmm. as a defector. This is a picture of, of my native town, Metishe, about 20 miles north from Moscow. Uh, characteristically, there is a statue of Comrade Lenin in the central square. Uh, this is myself at the age of seven. Again, characteristically, under the statue of Comrade Stalin, extending his friendly hand to peoples of the world. Uh, at that age, of course, uh, I was still idealistically minded young communist, and um, I still believe that sooner or later things will go for better. But I realized that the system stinks, that something is fishy, and that ideology is, is fake and the uh, propaganda about ad advanced Soviet agriculture simply didn't meet the criteria of reality. If they talk about uh, abundance of food and, and there is none in the stores, there must be something wrong. Um, my father was, he is on the left here, my father was um, officer of the general staff of the Soviet army. He was inspector of land forces, Soviet troops stationed in countries like Mongolia, Cuba, uh, East European countries. Were he alive today, most likely he would be inspecting Soviet troops in, in Nicaragua, Angola, and many other parts of the world. Fortunately, he died, and he didn't see the disgrace, because deep inside, he was a Russian patriot. He didn't, he didn't like the idea of expanding Soviet military might, especially in the areas where, where we were not welcomed at all. Unlike many other military officers, he was reporting directly to the Minister of Defense, bypassing KGB and diplomatic service. In other words, he was a trusted military professional. And my impression that this type of people are much less hawkish and adventuristic than party bureaucrats in Kremlin. When American mass media describes Soviet military as potentially dangerous counterpart for, for Pentagon, I simply laugh because I know better. I know that the most dangerous part of the Soviet power structures are not military at all. Most likely, if they come to power in my country, they'll be more sensible negotiators for nuclear disarmament and withdrawal of the Soviet troops from many parts of the world. But if someone from the party structure or the KGB structure were to give the orders for a military They have to obey, they, they yes, would because they are, they, are, they are professional military. But they, you see, the triangle of power and hate in USSR is the party at the top, mm -hmm the party elite, the oligarchy of the party, then the military and the KGB at the bottom. Mm -hmm. They hate each other. And uh, the most hated triangle, uh, the most hated corner of the triangle is the Communist Party bureaucrats. They are the most adventuristic, senile megalomaniacs. They can start war, I wouldn't be surprised. Not the military. They know what war is. Yeah. At least my father yeah. did. This is the picture taken at the, at the entrance of my Institute of Oriental Languages. It's a part of Moscow State University. I uh, graduated in 1963. 
and I. Now, excuse me. Which one were you on? I I am on the right. You're on the right. And on the left is my uh, uh, my schoolmate Vadim Smirnov, who later was a apparatchik in the Central Committee of the Soviet Union Communist Party. What is an apparatchik? It's it's a it's a functionary, something like civil service uh, in British Empire. Some someone who is never fired from from the service. He stays there internally. He may not be promoted too high, but he's a dependable. Um, bureaucrat who will stay mm. forever. Uh, I studied not only languages but also history, literature, e even music. I'm, I'm on this picture. I'm trying to learn how to play musical in, uh, Indian musical instrument. I even tried to look like an Indian when I was second year student. Not bad, right? Really. Uh, yes, uh, th actually, it was strongly in encouraged by the by the instructors in my school because. Uh, this, the graduates of my school were later on employed as diplomats, foreign journalists, or spies. Uh, as every Soviet student, I was, quote unquote, volunteering for harvesting grain in Kazakhstan. This is the biggest uh, agricultural blunder of the Soviet government. Uh, but um, I didn't have much choice, of course, because the communist motto borrowed from the Bible says, those who do not work shall not eat and you can see me eating therefore I was working and you can see how happy I was about it I went through a very extensive physical and military training uh, including the manure uh, un including the uh, military games in, in uh, uh, areas uh, suburban areas of Moscow and here for example we are on the tour in Arkhangelsk area and by the end of my training in school, I was recruited by the KGB. This picture was taken on that day, and you can see again how happy it feels to be recruited by the KGB. Our conversation with Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov, who is a defector from the Soviet Union, a former propaganda agent for Novosti and the KGB, will continue after this message. As every student in USSR, I, I went through very extensive physical and military training and civil defense training too. Unlike in the United States, where civil defense is virtually non-existent, zero. Uh, in USSR, every uh, student, whatever is major subject, has to go through very extensive four-year military and civil defense training. You can see me here with a group of students during one of the war games in ne near Moscow. Uh, the main idea, of course, is to prepare a huge reserve army of, of, of the USSR. Each student has to, to graduate as a junior lieutenant. In my case, it was administrative and military intelligence service. My first assignment was to India as a translator with the Soviet Economical Aid Group building refinery complexes in Bihar state and Gujarat state. At that time, I was still naively um, idealistically believing that what I was doing contributes to the understanding and cooperation between the nations. Uh, it took me quite a number of years to realize that what we were bringing to India was a new type of colonialism, thousand times more oppressive and exploitative than any colonialism or imperialism in, in history of mankind. Uh, but at that time, I was still hoping that, well, maybe it's not that bad, could be worse, and things may go for better. And I even tried to implement the beautiful Marxist motto, proletarians of all the countries unite. I tried to unite with a nice Indian girl. <laughs> and I was, actually, I was fascinated by Indian culture, by, by the family life in, in this country. But obviously, Communist Party had different plans for my genes, so I had to marry this beautiful Russian girl. Uh, in the span of my career, I married three times. Most of these marriages were marriages of convenience on advice from the Department of Personnel. This is normal practice in USSR. When a Soviet citizen is assigned to a foreign job, he has to be married, either to keep family in USSR as hostages, or if it's a convenience marriage like mine, 
so that the husband and wife are virtually informers on each other to prevent defection or uh, contamination by decadent imperialist or capitalist ideas. In my case, I hated that girl so much that the moment I landed in Moscow, we, uh, we were divorced and I, uh, I married late a second time. By the end of my first assignment in India, I was promoted to the position of, of public relation officer. You can see me here translating a speech by a Soviet boss. And on you're on the right. I'm right? on the right here, yes. Mm -hmm. And it was, the occasion was commissioning of the refinery complex in Bihar, Barauni. Uh, back in Moscow, I was immediately recruited by Novosti Press Agency, which is a propaganda and ideological subversion front for the KGB. 75% of the members of the Novosti are commission officers of the KGB. The other 25 are, like myself, co-opted agents who are assigned to specific operations. In this particular case, you can see me talking to students of Lumumba Friendship University in Moscow. Um, this is the a, a huge school under the uh, direct control of the KGB and Central Committee where future leaders of the so-called national liberation movements are being educated and selected carefully. And some of them have absolutely, they, neither this, for example, is a group of students from Lumumba. They don't look like students at all. They look more like military, and that's exactly what they were. They were dispatched back to their countries to be leaders of the so-called national liberation movements or to be translated into normal human language, leaders of uh, international terrorist groups. Another uh, area of activity when I was working for the Novosti was to accompany groups of so-called progressive intellectuals, writers, journalists, publishers, uh, teachers, professors of, of, of colleges. He, you can see me here in Kremlin, I'm second on, on the left, with a group of Pakistani and Indian intellectuals. Uh, most of them pretended they don't understand that uh, we are actually working on behalf of the Soviet government and the KGB. They pretended that they are actually being guests, a VIP intellectuals, that they are treated according to their merits and, and, and their intellectual abilities. For us, they were just a bunch of political prostitutes to be taken advantage for various propaganda operations. Therefore, you can see perfectly well the senior colleague of mine on the left doesn't really have that much respect on his face and myself with a very skeptical f smile uh, typical KGB sarcastic smile anticipating another victim of, of ideological brainwashing this is how a, a typical uh, conference in Novosti headquarters in Moscow look like uh, sitting in the middle is Boris Burkov, the then director of Novosti Press Agency, high-ranking party bureaucrat in the Department of Propaganda. I am standing next to a famous Indian poet, Sumitranandan Pant. Uh, he was famous because he was an author, he was the author of a famous poem titled Rhapsody to Lenin. That's why he was invited to USSR and everything was paid uh, by the Soviet government. The pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. This is one of the ways to kill the awareness or curiosity of, of foreign journalists. My, one of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. I had to take them to the VIP lounge and toast to friendship and understanding between the nations of the world. Glass of vodka, then the second glass of vodka. And in no time, my guests would be feeling very happy. They would see everything in kind of pink, nice color. And uh, that's the way I, I had to keep them permanently for the next 15 or, or 20 days. At certain point in time, I had to withdraw alcohol from them so that some of them who are the most recruitable would feel a little bit shaky, guilty, trying to remember what they were talking last night. That's the time to approach them with all kind of nonsense, such as joint communique or statement for, for Soviet propaganda. Uh, that's the time they are in the most flexible. And of course, what they didn't understand, they didn't realize or pretended not to realize, that myself, who was drinking together with them, uh, was not drinking at all. I had ways to get rid 
of alcohol through various techniques, including special pills which were given to me by my colleagues. Uh, but they were taking it seriously. In other words, they, they, they would consume quite a large volumes of alcohol and feel quite uneasy next morning. Um, in 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine. A group of 12 people arrived to USSR from United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October Socialist Revolution in my country. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies, propaganda cliché, which were presented to American readers as opinions and deductions of American journalists. Nothing could be far from truth. These were not opinions. They were not opinions at all. Uh, they were the clichés which the Soviet propaganda wants American public to think that they think. That if it does make any sense at all. It sure does, because from the viewpoint of the Soviet propaganda, although there are some subtle criticism of the Soviet system, the basic message is that Russia today is a nice, functioning, efficient system supported by majority of population. That's the biggest lie. And of course, American intellectuals and journalists from Look Magazine elaborated on that untruth in various different ways. They intellectualized that lie. They found all kinds of justifications for telling lies to American public. Um, this and, is excuse me, it was partly your job to make sure that they got these ideas yes. and accepted them as their own ideas. Right. Actually, even before they arrived to USSR, and they paid astronomical sum of money for that visit, uh, they were submitted, uh, the this Novosti Press Agency developed so-called backgrounders, 20, 25 pages of information and opinions which were presented to the journalists even before they bought their tickets to Moscow. They had to analyze the situation and judging on their reaction to that backgrounder, the local Novosti representative or local Soviet diplomat in Washington, D.C. would assess whether they have, whether they be given visa to USSR or not. Yeah. So but they were selected ahead oh, of yes. time. Oh, yes. They were, they were pre-selected very carefully. And uh, there is not much chance for honest journalists to arrive to USSR and to stay there for one year and to bring this uh, package of lies back home. This, for example, is a centerfold of the, ty of, of the Look magazine. They presented this monument erected by Communist Party in Stalingrad as the symbol, personification of Russian military might. And they said in the article, which is published on, on the side, that Soviets are very proud of the victory in the Second World War. This is another big myth, a lie. No sensible people would be proud to lose 20 millions of their countrymen in a war which was started by Genosse Hitler and Comrade Stalin and paid by American multinationals. Most of the Soviet citizens look at this type of monuments with disgust and sorrow because every family lost father, brother, sister or child in the Second World War. Yet, American journalists who were trying to appease, to please their hosts, presented this picture on the centerfold as the symbol and personification of Soviet national, uh, they call it Russian national spirit. And it was greatest, greatest misconception and, and a very tragic misunderstanding. Of course, Luke magazine was not distributed in USSR. The main uh, audience was in United States. But uh, I presume that many Americans, millions of Americans who were reading Look magazine at that time, had absolutely wrong idea about the sentiments of my nation, about what the Soviets are proud of and what they hate. This is a group, you see the same lady with the sword in Stalingrad. This is the group of journalists. Myself is in the center with the same devilish smile. And Mr. Philip Harrington is on the extreme left there with, with his camera. Uh, this is the gentleman which was so deaf or so uninterested in what I had to say to him. Uh, this is the same picture, a blow up of the same, of the same picture. Uh, many, many guests from various countries, in this particular case from Asia and Africa, were taken by me as a Novosti Press Agency employee, 
uh, for a tour across Siberia, for example. We would show them typical kindergarten, you see? Nothing special by American standards, just nice children sitting, eating their breakfast or, or lunch. Uh, what they could not understand, or they pretended not to understand, that this is an exemplary kindergarten. This is not the kindergarten for average person or average family in USSR. And we maintain that illusion in their minds. You can see myself under the red spot in the middle there uh, with the same business-like expression. I'm, on, you know, I'm doing my job. That, that's what I'm assigned to do, and that's what I was paid to do. But deep inside, I still hope that at least some of these useful idiots would understand that what they are looking at has nothing to do with the level of affluence in my nation. This is a better picture which reflects the true spirit of, of the Soviet, chi uh, ch Soviet childhood. This picture was printed in a Canadian government publication by mistake. In the middle, you can see children playing on a, sm a small courtyard, and the caption goes, this is a typical kindergarten in Siberia. What these idiots didn't understand, that it is not kindergarten at all. It is a prison for children of political prisoners. Mm. But there was not a single mentioning that what they were visiting actually was an area of concentration camps. And the job of people like myself to help them to n not to notice that they are actually talking to prisoners. Most of the children were dressed, especially on the occasion of the foreigner's visit. Uh, the, uh, of course, there were no corpses in, on the ground. There were no machine gun guards. And uh, the... Well, it looks not very pleasant, as you see. It's a, it, it looks dull, but obviously it does not create an impression that this is actually a prison. Well, did any of the journalists have the uh, curiosity to ask about uh, prisons and that kind of thing? Yes. They were in Siberia. This yes. is what you associate. Some of, yes. Some of them asked questions, and naturally we, we would give them, the, for the stupid question, we give them stupid answer. No, there are no prisons in Siberia. No, most of the people who are you see are free citizens of USSR. They are very happy to be here, uh, and, and they are contributing to the glory of the socialist system. Uh, some of them pretended that they, they believe what, what I was uh, telling them, and um, most of them, we may discuss it later, what are the motivations of these people? Why would they stubbornly bring lies to their own population through their own mass media? I have various answers to this. There is not a single explanation. It's a complex of explanations. It's fear, pure biological fear. They understand that they are on the territory of an enemy state, a police state. And just to save their rotten skins and their miserable jobs, their affluence back home, they would prefer to tell a lie than to, to ask truthful questions and, and report truthful information. Second, most of these schmucks were uh, afraid to lose their jobs because obviously if you tell truth about my country you will not last long as a correspondent of New York Times uh, or, or Los Angeles Times they will fire you what kind of correspondent are you you obviously cannot find common language with Russians if they kick you out in 24 hours so just by by trying to be conformist to their own editorial bosses they tried not to offend the sentiments of the Soviet administrators and people like myself Deep inside, I hope they would insult my, uh, or offend my sentiments. Obviously, they preferred not to. Uh, another reason, uh, I, did, I, I refuse to believe it, but obviously, there is another reason. Obviously, it's a greed. These people earn a lot of money. When they come back to USA, they claim that they are experts on my country. They write books which sell in million copies, titled like Russians, The Truth About Russia. Most of it is lie about Russia. Yet they claim to be Sovietologists. They, they, bring, they play back myth about my country, the propaganda cliches. Yet they are stubbornly resist a, a, the word of truth. If a, a person like Solzhenitsyn is either defecting or kicked out of USSR, they try all their best to, dis to discredit him and to discourage him. I don't have much chance to appear on national network. Uh, with a true story about my country. But a useful idiot like Hendrik Smith or Robert Kaiser, they are big heroes. They come back from USSR. They say, oh, we were talking to dissidents in Russia. Big deal. 
Soviet dissidents are chasing American correspondents in the streets, and they are cowardly escaping from these contacts. For some strange reason, if you want to know more about Spain, you refer to Spanish writers. If you want to learn more about French, you read French or writers. Even about Antarctica, I bet you would read penguins. <laughs> Only about the Soviet Union, for some strange reason, you read Hendrix and Schmendrix and all kinds of Kissingers, because they claim that they know more about my country. They know nothing, or next to nothing. Or they pretend that they know more than they actually do. I would say they are dishonest people who lack integrity and uh, common sense and intellectual honesty. They bring back all kinds of stories like that. A kindergarten in Siberia. Mm -hmm. Omitting the most important fact, it's a prison for children of political prisoners. Uh, another greatest example of monumental idiocy of American politicians. Uh, Edward Kennedy was in Moscow, and he thought that he is a popular, charismatic American politician who is easygoing, who can smile, dance at the wedding in, in Russian Palace of Marriages. What he, did, what he did not understand, or maybe he pretended not to understand, that actually he was being taken for a ride. This is a staged wedding, especially to impress foreign media or, or useful idiots like Ed Kennedy. Most of the, of the guests there, they, they, they had security clearance and they were instructed what to say to foreigners. This is exactly what I was doing. You can see me in the same damn wedding palace in Moscow where Ed Kennedy was dancing here, you see, smiling. He thinks he's very smart. From the viewpoint of Russian citizens who observe this idiocy, he's, he's narrow-minded, egocentrical idiot who tries to earn his own popularity through, the, uh, through participation in propaganda farces like this. Here you can see myself. On the right, again, exemplary Soviet bride. On the left, three journalists from various countries, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, obviously they enjoying the situation. They, they will go back home and write the reports. We were present at the, on a regular Soviet wedding. They were not present on a regular Soviet wedding. They were present, they were part of a farce, of a circus performance. Uh, another thing which I had to sometimes risking my life to explain to foreigners, Time magazine, for example, is very critical of South African racist regime. The whole article was dedicated to the shameful internal passport si system where black, blacks are not allowing to live with whites. For some strange reason, for the last 14 years since my defection, nobody wanted to pay attention to my passport. This is my passport. It also shows my nationality, and it, it, it has a police rubber stamp which is called prapiska in Russian language, which assigns me to a certain area of residence. I cannot leave that area, same way as this black man cannot leave the area in South Africa. Yet we call South African government racist regime. Not a single Jane, Jane Schmonda or Fonda is brave enough, courageous enough to come to media and say, look, this is what happens in USSR. I send a copy of, of my passport to many American liberals and civil rights uh, defenders and, and all the other useful idiots. They never, they never bothered to answer me back. This shows what kind of integrity, what kind of honesty these people are. They are a bunch of hypocrites because they don't want to recognize a good example of racism in my country. This is the first stage of befriending a professor. You can see myself on the left with the same James Bond smile. On, my, on the right is my KGB supervisor, Comrade Leonid Mitrohin, and in the middle, a professor of political science in Delhi University. The next stage would be to invite him to a gathering of Indo-Soviet Friendship Society. There he is sitting next to his wife before he is being sent to USSR for free trip. Everything is paid by the Soviet government. He was made to believe that he is invited to USSR because he is a talented, sober-thinking intellectual. Absolutely false. He is invited because he is a useful idiot, because he would agree and subscribe to most of the Soviet propaganda cliché. And when he is coming back to, to his own country, he is going for years and years 
to teach the beauties of Soviet socialism to uh, newer and newer generations of his students, thus promoting the Soviet propaganda line. Uh, the KGB was even curious about this gentleman. It may look innocent. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, a great spiritual leader, or maybe a great charlatan and crook, depending on which, from which side you're looking at him. Uh, Beatles were trained at his ashram in Hardwar in India, how to meditate. Mia Farrow and, and other uh, useful idiots from Hollywood visited his um, school and they returned back to the United States absolutely zonked out of their minds with marijuana, hashish, and crazy ideas of meditation. To meditate, in other words, to isolate oneself from the current social and political issues of your own country. To get into your own bubble, to forget about troubles of the world. Obviously, KGB was very fascinated with such a beautiful school, such a, a brainwashing center for stupid Americans. I was dispatched by the KGB to check what kind of VIP Americans attend this school. That's you on the left. Yes, right? I'm on the yeah. left. Uh, I, I, I was trying to get enrolled in that school. Unfortunately, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi asked too much. He wanted 500 American dollars for enrollment. But my function was not actually to get enrolled in the school. My function was to discover what kind of people from the United States attend this school. And we discovered that, yes, there are some influential members of family, uh, uh, public opinion makers of United States who come back with the crazy stories about Indian philosophy. Indians themselves look up upon them as idiots, useful idiots. To say nothing about KGB who looked at them as, as, as extremely naive, misguided people. Obviously, a VIP, say a wife of, of, of a congressman, or, or a prominent Hollywood personality, after, the, after being trained in that school, is much more instrumental in the hands of, of manipulators of public opinion and KGB than a normal person who, who understands, who, who looks through this, this, uh, this, this type of, of uh, fake religious training. Why would they be more susceptible to manipulation? I just mentioned that because, you see, a, a person who is too much involved in, 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 in introspective meditation. You see, if you carefully look what, what Maharishi Mahesh Yogi is teaching to, to Americans, is that all, most of the problems, most of the burning issues of today can be solved simply by meditating. Don't, don't, don't rock the boat. Don't get involved. Just sit down, look at your navel and meditate. And the things, due to some strange logic, due to cosmic vibration, will, will, will settle down by themselves. This is exactly what the KGB and Marxist-Leninist propaganda wants from Americans, to distract their uh, opinion, uh, attention, and mental energy from real issues of the United States into a non-issues, into a non-world, non-existent uh, harmony. Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, uh, physically fit, and alert to, to the reality. Mm -hmm. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi obviously is not on the payroll of the KGB. But w whether he knows it or not, he contributes greatly to demoralization of American society. And he's not the only one. There are hundreds of those gurus who come to, you, to your country to capitalize on naivete and stupidity of, of Americans. It's a fashion. It's a fashion to meditate. It's a fashion not to be involved. So obviously, you can see that if, if KGB were uh, that curious, if they paid my trip to Hardwar, if they assigned me to that, to that strange job, obviously they were very much fascinated. They were convinced that that type of, of, of brainwashing is very efficient and instrumental in demoralization of the United States. Our conversation with Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov, who is a defector from the Soviet Union, a former propaganda agent, for Novosti and the KGB will continue after this message.
this picture shows the part of the building of USSR embassy, and my supervisors on the left is Comrade Mehdi, an Indian communist, and on the right, Comrade Mitrokhin, my supervisors in the secret department of research and counter-propaganda. It has nothing to do with either research or counter-propaganda. Most of the activity of that department was to compile huge amount, volume of information on individuals who were instrumental in creating public opinion. Publishers, editors, journalists, uh, actors, educationalists, professors of political science, members of parliament, uh, pre uh, representatives of business circles. Most of these people were divided roughly into groups. Those who would tow the Soviet foreign policy, they would be promoted to the positions of power through media and public opinion manipulation. Those who refused the Soviet influence in their own country would be character assassinated or executed physically come revolution. Same way as uh, in the small town of Hue in South Vietnam, several thousands of Vietnamese were executed in one night when the city was captured by Viet Cong for only two days. And American CIA could never figure out how could possibly communists know each individual where he lives, where, where to get him, and would be arrested in one night, basically in, in some four hours before dawn, put on a van, taken out of the city limits, and shot. The answer is very simple. Long before communists occupied the city, there was extensive network of informers, local Vietnamese citizens, who knew absolutely everything about people who were instrumental in public opinion, including barbers and taxi drivers. Everyone who was sympathetic to the United States was executed. Same thing was done under the guidance of, of the Soviet embassy in Hanoi, and same thing I was doing in New Delhi. To my horror, I discovered that in the files where people were doomed to execution, there were names of, of pro-Soviet journalists with whom I was personally friendly. Pro-Soviet? Yes. They were idealistically minded leftists who uh, made several visits to USSR, and yet the KGB decided that come revolution or drastic changes in political structure of India, they will have to go. Why is that? Because they, they know too much. Mm -hmm. Simply because, you see, the useful idiots, the, the leftists who are idealistically believing in the beauty of Soviet socialist or communist or whatever system, when they get disillusioned, they become the worst enemies. That's why my KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. Forget about these political prostitutes. Aim higher. This was my instruction. Try to get into, into uh, large circulation established conservative media. Reach filthy rich movie makers, intellectuals, so-called academic circles. Cynical, egocentric people who can look into your eyes with angelic expression and tell you a lie. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or to uh, suffer from self-importance. Uh, they feel that uh, they, they matter a lot. Uh, these are the people who KGB wanted very much to recruit. But also, to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be no, the ones they, they rely they on? they serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in, in United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, the, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karman with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. 
It's the same pattern everywhere. The moment they serve their purpose, all the useful idiots are used, either be executed entirely, all the idealistically minded Marxists, or uh, uh, exiled or put in prisons, like in Cuba. Many, many former Marxists are in Cuba, I mean in prison. So most of the Indians who were cooperating with the Soviets, especially without uh, a de department of, of uh, information of the USSR embassy, were listed for execution. Uh, and when I discovered that fact, of course I was sick. I was mentally and physically sick. I thought that I, I'm going to explode one day during the briefing at the ambassador's office. I would stand up and say something that we are basically a bunch of murderers. That's what we are. We, it has nothing to do with friendship and understanding between the nation and blah, blah, blah. We are murderers. We behave as a bunch of thugs in, in a country which, which is hospitable to us, a country which, which, with ancient traditions. But I, I, I did not defect. I tried to get the message across to my horror. Nobody wanted even to listen, least of all to believe what I had to say. And I tried all kinds of tricks. I would, I would, I would uh, leak information through letters uh, or lost documents or something like that. And still I got no message. Uh, the message was not published even in the conservative mass media of, of India. The immediate impulse to defect was Bangladesh crisis, which was described by American correspondents as Islamic grassroots revolution, which is absolute baloney. Uh, there was nothing to do with Islam, and there was no grassroots revolution. Actually, there are no grassroots revolutions, period. Any revolution is a byproduct of a highly organized group uh, of conscientious and professional um, uh, organizers, but it has nothing to do with grassroots. In Bangladesh, it was nothing with grassroots. Most of the uh, Awami League party members, Awami League means People's Party, uh, were trained in Moscow in the high party school. Most of the Mukti Fauj leaders, Mukti Fauj is in Bengali means People's Army, same as SWAPO and, and all kind of liberation armies all over the world, the same bunch of useful idiots. They were trained at Lumumba University and various centers of the KGB in Simferopol, in, in Crimea, and in Tashkent. So when I saw that India, Indian territory is being used as a, as a jumping board to destroy East Pakistan, I saw myself thousands of, of so-called students traveling through India to East Pakistan, through the territory of India, and Indian government pretended not to see what was going on. They knew perfectly well, the Indian police knew it, the intelligence department of Indian government knew it, the KGB of course knew it, and the CIA knew it. That, that was most infuriating because when I defected and I explained to the CIA debriefers they should watch out because East Pakistan is going to erupt any moment. They said I, 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 was, I was reading too, too many James Bond novels. Anyway, so East Pakistan was doomed. Uh, one of my colleagues in, in the Soviet consulate in Calcutta, when he was dead drunk, he ventured into the basement to, to relieve himself and he found that big boxes which said printed matter to Dhaka University. Dhaka is the capital of East Pakistan. And since he was drunk and curious, he opened one of the boxes and he discovered not printed matter. He discovered Kalashnikov guns and ammunition in there. Anyway, it's a long story. When I saw the, the preparations for the, for the uh, invasion into East Pakistan, obviously I wanted to defect immediately. The only thing I couldn't, I couldn't at that time uh, make up my mind when and where and how. One of the reasons, of course, you see, I was in love with India. I mentioned that before. I spoke the languages. I socialized with people. And I understood that I had to, to act fast unless I want this beautiful country to be permanently and irreparably damaged by our presence. One of the reasons not to defect was, as you can see, I was living in relative affluence. Who the hell in, in, in a normal mind would defect and do what? To be abused by your media? To be called McCarthyist and fascist and paranoid? Or to drive a taxi in New York City? What for? What the hell for should I defect? To be abused by, by Americans? To be insulted in exchange for, for my effort to bring the truthful information about impending danger of subversion? As you can see, I was living in quite a comfortable conditions next to swimming pool where Indians were not allowed, by the way. I was highly paid expert in propaganda. I had my family. I was respected by my nation. M my career was cloudless. 
The third reason, how to defect with the family. To defect with the baby and the wife would be virtual suicide because uh, according to law, that hypocritical law which I quoted before, the Indian police will have to hand me over back to the KGB and that will be the end of my defection and probably my life. Again, I cannot smuggle my wife because she was not quite sure what, what I was doing. She was not that idealistically involved and she was definitely not in, in, in the total picture of what I was doing for the KGB. She would be shocked if I, if I uh, you know, put her in my van and, and drive her to an American embassy or elsewhere. That would be a greatest danger. So again, I had to defect in such a way that my defection would look as simple disappearance. And there were many cases like that when the Soviet agents simply disappeared, either killed in action or thanks to their curiosity and, and their close contacts with radicals. Some of them were killed by the Marxists, by the way. It happened in many African countries when the Soviet KGB were killed by Africans themselves. Not because they hated Marxism-Leninism, but because they were simply a trigger-happy bunch of unruly characters. If you give them a machine gun, they will shoot. And some of the Soviets obviously were not careful enough to protect themselves, and they got into embarrassing situations when they were shot at the crossfire between factions of, of so-called liberation movements. Anyway, so I, I decided, as I said, to study the um, counterculture. I decided this probably would be the best way to disappear. I socialized with characters like this on the left. You see, he's a barefoot American hippie. Uh, it took me quite a long time to study exactly what they were doing and how to mix with them. But eventually I did it. Most of Indian newspapers carried my picture and promise of 2,000 rupees for information about my whereabouts. But they were looking for the wrong person because they obviously tried to stop a young Soviet diplomat in white shirt and tie. And th this is how I looked at the time of defection. Nobody could possibly think that a Soviet diplomat would be as crazy as to join a bunch of hippies. That's you. Tra yes, travel yeah. India and smoke hush. So I made it literally a, a, almost like a Hollywood style uh, detective story uh, from under the nose of the KGB in Bombay airport I landed a plane and I flew to to Greece where I was debriefed by the CIA that's basically most th that's all for, for my okay, we can slides turn the, we can turn off the projector and that's very interesting well you spoke several times before about ideological subversion that is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of it intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy. 
exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of, the, uh, of the United States society. And yet these people have been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept. Mm -hmm. These are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, obviously they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they, obviously, they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can, you can get uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand, and uh, it will be the greatest shock for them, of course. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's overfulfilled, because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. So basically America is stuck. With, with demoralization and unless even if, if you start right now here this minute you start educating new generation of Americans it will still take you 15 to 20 years to turn the tide of, uh, of ideological perception of reality uh, back to normal no, normalcy and, and uh, patriotism the next stage is destabilization this time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense, an economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. 
Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with the benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will go to Moscow to kiss the bottoms of, of new generation of Soviet assassins, never mind. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. United States is in a state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. And, and the initiator of this war is not Comrade Andropov, of course. Uh, it's, it's the system However ridiculous it may sound, the world communist system or the world communist conspiracy, whether I scare some people or not, I don't give a hoot. Uh, if, if you are not scared by now, nothing can scare you. But you don't have to be paranoid about it. What, what actually happens now, that unlike myself, you have literally several years to live on unless the United States wake up. The, the time bomb is ticking with every second. The disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to. Unless you want to live in Antarctica with penguins. This is it. This is the last country of freedom and, and possibility. Okay, so what do we do? What is your recommendation to the American people? Well, uh, the, uh, the, um, the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, of course, there must be a very strong national effort to educate people in, in, in the spirit of real patriotism, number one. Number two, to, to explain them the real danger of socialist, communist, whatever, welfare state, big brother government. If people will fail to grasp the impending danger of that development, nothing ever can help the United States. You may kiss goodbye to your freedom, including freedoms to, to homosexuals, to uh, prison inmate, all this freedom will vanish, evaporate in, in five seconds, including your precious lives. Um, the second thing, I, the moment at least part of the United States population is convinced that the danger is real, they have to force their government. And I'm not talking about sending letters, signing petitions, and all this beautiful, noble activity. I'm talking about forcing United States government to stop aiding communism. Because there is no other problem more burning and, and urgent than to stop the Soviet military industrial complex from destroying what is, whatever is left of the free world. And it is very easy to do. No credits, no technology, no money, no political or diplomatic recognition, and of course no such idiocy as grain deals to USSR. The Soviet people, 270 millions of, of Soviets, will be eternally thankful to you if you stop aiding a bunch of murderers who sit now in Kremlin and whom President Reagan respectfully calls government. They do not govern anything, least of all such complexity as the Soviet economy. So basic, two, two very simple, maybe two simplistic answers or solutions, but never, nevertheless, they are the only solutions. Educate yourself. Understand what's going on around you. You are not living at the time of peace. You are in a state of war. And you have precious little time to save yourself. Um, you don't have much time, especially if you are talking about young generation. There's not much time left for 
convulsions and sexual masturbation uh, d uh, to the beautiful uh, disco music. Very soon it will go, just, just overnight. If we are talking about capitalists or, or, or wealthy businessmen, they, I think they are selling the rope on which they will hang very soon. If they don't stop, if they cannot curb their unsettled desire for profit, and if they keep on trading with the monster of the Soviet communism, they are going to hang very soon. And it, they will pray to be killed, but unfortunately they will be sent to Alaska probably to manage industry of slaves. It's, it's simplistic. I know it sounds unpleasant. I know Americans don't like to listen to things which are unpleasant. But I have defected not to tell you the stories about such idiocy as, as microfilm, James Bond type, espionage. This is garbage. Uh, you don't need any espionage anymore. I have come to talk about survival. It's a question of survival of this system. Um, you may ask me, what is it in for me? Survival, obviously, because unlike, I, as I said, I am now in your boat. If, if we sing together, we'll sing beautifully together. There is no other place on this planet to defect to. Subversion is the term, if, if you look in a, in a dictionary or criminal code to that matter, usually is, ex is explained as a part of activity to destroy things like uh, religion, government, system, political, econ economical system of a country. And usually it's linked to espionage and such romantic things as blowing up bridges, sidetracking trains, um, clock and dagger activity in Hollywood style. Uh, when what I'm going to talk about now has absolutely nothing to do with the cliché of espionage or KGB activity of collecting information. So the greatest mistake or mis mis misconception, I think, is that uh, whenever we are talking about KGB for some strange reason, uh, starting from Hollywood movie makers to professors of political science and quote-unquote experts on, on Soviet affairs or Kremlinologists as they call themselves, they think that the most desirable thing for Andropov and the whole KGB is to steal blueprints of some supersonic jet, bring it back to Soviet Union and sell it to the Soviet military industrial complex. It's only partly true. If, if, if we take <clears throat> the whole time, money, and manpower that the Soviet Union and KGB in particular spends outside of USSR border, we will discover, of course there are no official statistics unlike with CIA or FBI, that the espionage as such occupies only 10 to 15 percent of money, time, and manpower. 15 percent of the activity of KGB. The rest, 85 percent, is always subversion. And unlike a dictionary of English, Oxford Dictionary, subversion in Soviet terminology means always a destructive, aggressive activity aimed to destroy the country, nation, or geographical area of your enemy. So there's no romantics in there, absolutely. No blowing up bridges, no microfilms in Coca-Cola cans, nothing of that sort. <laughs> no James Bond nonsense. It's most of the, this activity is overt, legitimate, and easily observable if you give yourself time and trouble to observe it. But according to the law, 
and, and law enforcement systems of the Western civilization, it's not a crime. Exactly because of misconception, manipulation of terms. We think that subverter is a person who is going to blow up our beautiful bridges. No. Subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat, an actor, an artist, a journalist like myself was 10 years ago. Now, subversion <clears throat> is an activity which is a two-way traffic. You cannot subvert an enemy which doesn't want to be subverted. If you know history of Japan, for example, before the 20th century, Japan was a closed society. The moment a foreign boat comes to the shores of Japan, the Imperial Japanese Army politely tells them to get lost. <laughs> and if American salesman comes to the shore of Japan, let's say 60 or 70 years from now back, and says, oh, I have a very beautiful vacuum cleaner for you, you know, with the good financing, he says, please leave us, we don't need your vacuum cleaner. If they don't leave, they shoot them. To preserve their culture, ideology, traditions, values intact. You were not able to subvert Japan. You cannot subvert Soviet Union, because the borders are closed. The media is censored by the government. The population is controlled by the KGB and internal police. With all the beautiful, glossy pictures of Time magazine and Magazine America, which is published by, by the uh, American Embassy in Moscow, you cannot subvert Soviet citizens because the magazine never reaches Soviet citizens. It's collected from the newsstands and thrown to garbage can. Subversion can be only successful when the Initiator, the actor, the, act, the agent of subversion has a responsive target. It's a two-way traffic. United States is a receptive target of subversion. There is no response similar to that one from United States to the Soviet Union. It stops halfway somewhere. It never reaches here. The theory of subversion goes all the way back 2,500 years ago. The first human being who formulated the tactics of subversion was a Chinese philosopher by the name of Sun Tzu. To 2,500 years BC. He was an advisor for several imperial courts in, in ancient China. And he said, after long meditation, that to implement, foreign, uh, to implement state policy in a warlike manner, it's the most counterproductive, barbaric, and inefficient to fight on a battlefield. You know that war is continuation of state policy, right? So if you want successfully to implement your state policy and you start fighting, this is the most idiotic way to do it. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative, if not desirable, then at least visible. Better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired, if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. As you see, not a single mentioning of blowing up bridges. Of course, Sun Tzu didn't know about blowing up bridges. Maybe there were not that many bridges at that time. <laughs> but the basics 
of subversion uh, is being taught to every student of KGB school in USSR and to officers of, of military academies. I'm not sure if the same author is included in the list of reading for American officers, to say nothing about ordinary students of political science. I had difficulty to find the translation of Sun Tzu in, in the library of, of a university in Toronto and later on here in, in Los Angeles. But it's a, it's a book which is not available. It is forced to every student in USSR. Every student who is, who is taught to be dealing further in, in, in his future career with foreigners. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why, why 15 or 20 years? This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation. One lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped. Religion, educational system, social life, administration, law enforcement system, military, of course, and labor and employer relations, economy, okay? Five areas. Uh, I will not write them down because we will not have enough space. Some, sometimes when I describe all the methods, uh, students ask me question, are you sure this is the result of the Soviet influence? Not necessarily. You see, the tactic of subversion about which I'm talking is similar to the martial art, the Japanese martial art. If, you're, if some of you are familiar with that tactic, probably you will remember that if an enemy is bigger and heavier than yourself, it would be very painful to resist his direct strike. If a heavier person wants to strike me in the face, it would be very naive and counterproductive to stop his blow. The Chinese and Japanese judo art tells us what to do. First to avoid the strike, then to grab the fist and continue his movement in the direction where it was before, right? Until the enemy crashes in the wall. You see? So, what happens here? The target country obviously does something wrong. If it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There are obviously, in every society, there are people who are against this society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy, conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything. Right? And finally, there are a small group of agents of a foreign nation, bought, subverted, recruited. Right? The moment all these movements will be directed in one direction, Right? This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis. Right? So that's exactly the martial art tactic. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. 
And so on the stage of demoralization, obviously there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly, <clears throat> in case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it, replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion, to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being, that serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accepted, respected religious organizations with fake organizations. Distract people's attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient. Instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, anything, as long as it takes you away, okay? Uh, social life, replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people, take away the responsibility from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they are useful. Okay. Away from the natural links. Power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such group is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, pay, they, they, they have so much power, almost monopolistic power on your mind? They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are... They have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, President, and, and his administration. Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew, who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity. In a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you're better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. That's it. No more, no more competition. 
power structure slowly uh, is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power, and yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, kind of, well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the uh, whatever drug, but basically he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. No? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. And yet there are still some lawyers who say, look, he's a nice character, as a matter of fact. There was some witness who said, also a criminal, who said, well, he's a nice guy. I asked him one day to burn a house of my enemy, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> he's a nice fellow. A rosy. A slow substitution of basic moral principles, whereby a criminal is not a criminal, actually. He's a defendant, even if his guilt is proven. There is still a doubt to kill or not to kill, to be or not to be. Thy shall not kill, yes. But this uh, line may not necessarily be applicable to a murderer. Thy shall not murder. That should be the, the, the presumption, not, not that thy shall not kill. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, a person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force, C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me, and you give me your five pairs of shoes, and I will distribute it accordingly, so that the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, and death, death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. More than that, millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously uh, steel workers, say, 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer. Now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike in the middle of winter. You can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. 
What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving a, wor a, a worker's condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Pickets. Murders, shooting truck drivers by picketers. In Montreal, for example, I saw with my own eyes, when I was correspondent of CBC International, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, when the workers of aircraft factory destroyed computers and, and, and the equipment in the factory, and they, the, the administration employed strike breakers, their cars were turned upside down and burned. Their houses were burned, their kids were intimidated, and some victims were there. Of that you can be sure. Why? To improve conditions of workers? No. Ideology. Okay, so this is what happens, basically. It may or may not happen without the help of the Soviet Union. But the natural tendencies are being greatly taken advantage of and capitalized by the Soviet propaganda systems. How? Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination. The workers' right, and we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers' right. Whose rights? Workers? No. The, the only freedom of worker to sell his labor according to his own desire and will is taken away from him. By whom? By trade union boss. Unlimited power is given, responsibility. I want to sell my labor not for two fifty an hour, but for two dollars. I don't have right. My freedom is denied to me. I know that if I sell my work for two for two dollars an hour, not for three dollars an hour, I will compete better with the, with the other guy who is lazy and more greedy. I don't need two three dollars. I need only two dollars. No, I was made to believe by media, by business by advertising agencies that I need more and more and more. Have you ever heard any advertising on TV to consume less? No. <laughs> no way. Whether you need a, a, a six-cylinder car or not, you have to buy it and hurry up. <laughs> when I was driving here on the local radio station, an excited announcer said, "You." Hurry up, rush and save, save, save. There is a Penty Houses sale. <laughs> save by buying more. <laughs> of course, of course. It, it would be too naive to expect that KGB makes that advertising agency to, to do such a crazy commercial. No, of course not. But what we did when I was working for Novosti Press, we would snow plow editorial offices, student organizations, religious groups with literature of class struggle, May, if, if not directly Marxism, Leninist propaganda, then a propaganda of, of a legitimate aspirations of working class, betterment of life, equality, equality, mind you. President Kennedy once said, people, we will make America to believe that people are born equal. Are people born equal? Is there any mentioning in the Bible or any other holy scripture in any religion, any religion, if you don't believe me, go to the library and check it. There is not a single word about equality. Just the opposite. By your deeds, God will judge you. What you do is important. The merit of your personality. You cannot legislate equality. If you want to be equal, you have to be equal. You have to deserve it. And yet we build our society on the principle of equality. We say people are equal. We know it is false. It's a lie. Some people are tall and stupid. Others are short, bold, and clever. <laughs> <laughs> If we make them... <laughs> if we make them equal by force... <laughs> if we put the principle of equality in the basis of our socio-political structure, 
is the same thing as building a house on sand. Sooner or later it will collapse and that's exactly what happens. And we as Soviet propaganda makers are trying to push you in the direction which you go yourself. Equality, yes, equality, people are equal. Land of equal opportunities. Is it true or not? Think about it. Equal opportunities. Should there be equal opportunities? For me and for a lazy bastard who come here from some other country and immediately registers as, as a welfare mm -hmm. uh, recipient benefit. I never received a single dot. No, sorry, I did receive once. But I never applied for welfare. For the 13 years, I took any job. Security guard, journalist taxi driver, anything. Well, I was restless, but some people don't like it. They immediately... So why should we be... E why should we have equal opportunities? Why? The equal opportunity to excel. Equal opportunity in equal circumstances, yes, but we know people are different. To excel, yes, provided we reach the same level of excellency, perfection which is hypothetical distant future. Yes, maybe. But we know perfectly well that even with the best intentions, people could not be equal. Why should we have equality in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, say, legal system? Myself, I'm, I'm considering myself a law-abiding citizen, and a person who comes here to rob and shoot, say, uh, the United States administration on the carpet imported thousands of Cuban criminals. They were known criminals, yet they were accepted. Do you think it's fair if myself and my wife from Philippines who work like a, excuse me, horse uh, as a lab technician in the hospital should have the same rights as a criminal from, from Cuba? Why? And yet we repeat as parrots, equality, equality, equality. And the Soviet propaganda system helps us to believe that equality is something which is desirable. Democracy, as it was established by fathers of this country, of, of this system, in the last century, is, is not equality. It's the system where different people, unequal people, have a chance to survive and help each other in constant competition in constant perfection, not in equality, which is superimposed from, from a, a, a godfather or a nice person in Washington, D.C. And the absolute equality exists in Soviet Union, quote-unquote equality. Everybody is equal in, in dirt, except some people are more equal than the others in Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, where there's no division between evil and good, when even the leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in a countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia, and we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninists, that is my former colleagues from Novosti Press Agency. Okay, so we reach that point. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send a, a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges. No. You let them do it themselves. The area of application is, again, it's, it's, it's narrower now. Not like the, the previous case. The overt legitimate actions of the of the KGB in this case would be ha hardly noticeable 
there is no crime if a professor who recently went to USSR introduces a course of Marxism-Leninism in, in a, a, a Californian college, for example. Nobody is going to, to come to his doorstep and say, okay, mister, come, you are under arrest. No, it's not a crime. It's not even considered a moral crime against your country. So the area of application here is narrowing down to ec economy, again, labor relations, right? To law and order, plus military. And uh, economy, law and order. Yes, and again, the uh, media, but uh, wider scope, a little bit different. I'll explain it later. Okay, basically three areas. Economy, the radicalization of bargaining process. If on that stage we still could achieve, theoretically, some positive compromise between the negotiating sides with, with uh, say, uh, the ar ar arbitrary, in introduction of arbitrary judges, uh, third side, uh, objectively judging the, the demands of both. Sides. Here, it's radicalization. On, this, on the stage of destabilization, we cannot come to compromise even within a family. The husband and wife couldn't figure out which is better. Husband wants his kids to eat at the table, and wife wants him, a child, to roam around the room and, and drop food all over the floor. They cannot <laughs> come to compromise unless they start a fight. It's impossible to reach a compromise, constructive compromise, between neighbors. Some people say, I don't like you to work in your lawn at that time, because exactly at that time I'm walking my dog and he's getting nervous. He cannot uh, pass his bowels, you know. So They cannot compromise. They go to a, a, a civil court or something like that. Radicalization of human relations. No more compromise. Fight, fight, fight. The normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. The relations between teachers and students in schools and colleges fight. The, the relations between, in economical sphere between laborers and, and employers are further uh, radicalized. No more acceptance of the legitimacy of demands of workers. Unlike Japanese, with the theory Z, if you, if you ever heard about it, where the workers are involved in decision-making process. Therefore, they don't have uh, moral incentive to, to fight their, uh, uh, their bosses. In the United States, it's just the opposite. The harder is the, the fight, the better. The more heroic they look. When the Greyhound uh, network was on strike recently, the correspondents of local TV networks uh, all over the United States were approaching these strikers and they say, oh yes, we are doing something nice. They look like heroes and they were proud. There was some family, uh, the husband was a uh, bus driver. Now they decided in, 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 in a protest against the uh, uh, bosses to camp somewhere in the forest. And they were presented to the, to the audience as, as a heroic, nice people, you see. The violent clashes between passengers, picketers, and, and the strikers are presented as something normal. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would, we would, be, uh, we would be angry, say, why, why, why so much hatred? Today we are not. We say, well, it's commonplace. Radicalization, militarization sometimes. As I explained uh, uh, on that stage, I, I took a step a little bit further. Shooting people. Okay. Law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Now we are getting with this uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals, and the society at large. The media puts himself in the opposition to the society in general, at large. Separate, alienated, 
Okay? On that stage, you remember I was talking uh, a, a couple of hours ago about the sleepers. That's when the students from, say, United States, if they are trained in, in Lumumba University, or developing nations, that's the students I was dealing with, are being sent back from the Soviet Union here. Or if they were already in the United States, in the country, which is the object of, of subversion, they spring to action. The sleepers go up. They slept for 15 to 20 years. Now they become leaders of groups, preachers, uh, I don't know, public, public figures. Prominently they act. In, they actively include themselves in a political process. All of a sudden we see a homosexual. Fifteen years ago he did his dirty job and nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and Hiral is a large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the vision line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms, that is destabilization process. The sleepers, many of whom are simply KGB agents, become leaders of the process of destabilization. Doesn't mean that Comrade Andropov sends Comrade Ivanov to the United States. The person who takes care is already here. He is a respected citizen of the United States. Sometimes he, he gets money from various foundations for, for his legitimate uh, struggle for, I don't know, human rights, women rights, kid lib, prison lib, whatever. There are sympathetic Americans who donate their money to him. This uh, stabilization process usually leads directly to the process of crisis. In case of developing nations, that's the area where I, I was active. The process starts when, when the legitimate bodies of power, the social structure collapse. It's, it cannot function anymore. So instead, we have artificial body injected into society, such as non-elected committees. You remember I was talking about them here. Social workers who are not elected by people, media who, sell, who are self-appointed rulers of your opinion, uh, some strange groups uh, which claim that they know how to lead society forward. They don't usually. All they care is how to collect donations and, and, from, and sell their own concocted ideology, mixture of religion and ideology. Here, we have all this artificial body claiming power. If the power is denied to them, they take it by force. In case of Iran, for example, all of a sudden we have revolutionary committees. Who? What, what kind of revolution? There was no revolution yet, and yet they had the committees. They were taking power of, of judgment. They had, they had the power of execution, they had the power of, of uh, le legislation, and that they had the power of, of uh, judicial. Uh, all of them combined in one person, who is half-baked intellectual, sometimes graduated from Harvard University or, or Berkeley. He comes back to his country and, and he, he thinks that he, he knows the answer to all the social economical problems. Okay? Crisis is when society cannot function any more productively. It collapses, obviously. That's the, the word for crisis. So therefore, the population at large is looking for a savior. The religious groups are expecting a messiah to come. The workers say, we have family to feed. Let's have a strong government, maybe socialist government, centralized. When, when somebody put, put the employers on their place and, and let us work, we are sick and tired of going to strike and, and missing overtime and all that stuff. We need some strong man, strong government, a leader, a savior is needed. Population is sick and tired already. And here we are, we have a savior. 
either a foreign nation comes in or the local group of, of leftists, Marxists, no matter what they call themselves, Sandinista, a reverend or some sort, Bishop Muzureva, like in, in Zimbabwe, doesn't matter. A savior comes and says, I will lead you. So we have two alternatives here. Civil war and invasion. Okay? See how it goes? Civil war, we know what it is. Lebanon is, is the best example. The civil war, which was artificially implanted in Lebanon by injection of force of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Invasion, we have in many other countries like Afghanistan, uh, name any East European country, it, it was invaded by the Soviet army. But the result is the same. The next stage is normalization. Normalization is a very ironic word, of course. It is borrowed from 1968 situation in Czechoslovakia, when the Soviet propaganda and after them New York Times declared the country is normalized. The tanks moved into Prague, so there's no more Prague Spring, there's no more violence. Normal, normalization. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. So all the sleepers and activists and social workers and liberals and homosexuals and professors and Marxists and Leninists are being eliminated physically sometimes. They've done their job already. Okay? They are not needed anymore. The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So no more revolutionaries, please. And that's exactly what happens in a number of countries. You remember Bangladesh? This is the crisis in which I was instrumental. First they had Mujibur Rahman. In 1971 he was the leader of, of People's Party, Awami League with moustache like Stalin, he was in, in, in Russia many times. In five years, he was shot by his former colleagues, Marxists. He fulfilled his function. In Afghanistan, it happened three times. First there was Taraki, then there was Amin, now there's Babra Karmal. They killed each other successively, one after another. The moment he fulfills his duty, the first one demoralized country, the second destabilized, the third one brought it to crisis. Goodbye, comrades. <laughs> Babrak Karmal comes from Moscow and put him in, in, into the seat of power. Same thing happened in Grenada recently. Maurice Bishop, Marxist, was killed by Austin, what's his name, General something, who was also a Marxist. Right? So no more revolutions, please. Normalization now. From now on, no more strikes, no more homosexuals, no more women lib, no more kid lib. No more lib, period. <laughs> A good, solid, democratic, proletarian freedom. <laughs> now, to reverse this process takes enormous effort. When today, United States had to invade Grenada to reverse the process of subversion. Some people say, boy, this is not good, it's not kosher to invade the beautiful country, island of Grenada. <laughs> well, why didn't you stop the process here, when Grenada was just approached by leftists? Why not to prevent Maurice Bishop to come in power in the first place? Did Grenadians want him? Very questionable. They didn't know who was Maurice Bishop in the first place. He came to power by coup d'etat himself. Okay? No, we let the situation develop further and further and further until the crisis and normalization very soon. And then the United States decided to invade country, discovering that the, the country was absolutely a military base for the Soviet Union. Of course it's a drastic measure. Of course it's, it's a pity that uh, Marine Corps had to, to lose, what, 17 lives 
very bad. Why not to stop the process before it comes to crisis? Oh, no, intellectuals will not let you. It's interference in the, into domestic affairs. They are very careful not to, not, not to let American administration to interfere in domestic affairs of Latin American countries. They don't mind Soviet Union interfering in this affair. Okay. So to reverse this process from here, it takes only and always military force. No other force on earth can reverse this process at this point. At this point, it does not take military invasion of the United States Army. It takes strong action, like in Chile, a CIA covert involvement to prevent the savior from outside to come into power and to stabilize country before it erupts into civil war. Okay? Support the right-wing conservative forces. Buy money, buy crooks or love, doesn't matter. Stabilize the country. Don't let the crisis develop into, into civil war or invasion. Oh, no, your liberals will say it's, it's against the law. <laughs> the Congress will not appropriate money for covert actions of CIA. Why not? Should we wait till the normalization come and Soviet tanks land in, in, in Los Angeles airport? <laughs> now, at that point, at the point of destabilization, also the process could be reversed. Again, easily than this. No CIA involvement at this point. You know what it takes here? Restriction of some liberties for small groups which are self-declared enemies of the society. As simple as that. Oh no, the media and liberals will tell you this is against the American Constitution. How can we, uh, by force, deny the civil rights to criminals, for example? It's, it's not good. Okay? So we allow them to... Okay, if you allow the criminals to have civil rights, Go on and bring the country to the crisis. This is a bloodless way to do. Curb the rights. I mean, not to put them in prison. No, no, I'm not talking about putting all the gays from San Francisco in the concentration camp. Do not allow them to take political force. Do not elect them to the seats of power, whether it is municipality level, state level, or federal level. It has to be beaten in the heads of American voters, that a person like that in the seats of power is an enemy. Do not be afraid of this word. It is an enemy. If he is not an enemy here, he will be here. Later on he will be shot, of course. <laughs> but at this point he is an enemy. Okay? You are doing great service by denying him a right to capitalize on his own crazy ideas and become a powerful man, a, a man who uses the seat of power. Restriction of certain freedoms and permissiveness at that point would prevent sliding into crisis and probably will return the process of destabilization. To curb unlimited power, monopolistic power of trade unions here at that point would save economy from collapsing. To introduce a law to stop private companies of raping public opinion's mind in, con in, the, in the direction of consumerism. No company must have a right to force you into buying more unless you want it. There must be a law. You want to advertise your, your car? Okay. But not a single mentioning of Buying it now and saving money. <laughs> it must be against the law to force people to consume more. Self-restraint. Previously, before this process started, the self-restraint was a business of church, religion. Because our preachers, the fathers of church, would tell us, material values are good, but it's not the prime function of human being because you have to live with something obviously the design for our life is not to consume more deodorants <laughs> there must be something greater if such a complicated instrument as human body was created obviously there must be some higher purpose for that 
And it's very easy to avoid destabilization by denying the greedy companies one little freedom, one little liberty, forcing you into turning yourself into processors of unwanted pr products and goods. They turn you into machines, like a, 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 the worm who there's inlet and outlet. So, and how long a, a, an average appliance <laughs> lasts these days? Less than a year. Why? Where's workmanship? Oh, we want you to buy more. Okay. This stabilization process could be easily overcome if, as I say, the society, by its own will or after persuasion by the leaders, will come <coughs> to the idea of self-restraint. It's so hard we want to consume more, but you have to, unless you will come to this stage. When, as we say in Russia, if Sahara Desert ever becomes a communist state, there will be shortage of sand. <laughs> so you have to curb your... <laughs> you, have to, you have to curb your expectations at this point before it's too late. But no, we don't want to do it. Demoralization process. Again, it's the easiest thing to reverse. First of all, by restricting import of propaganda, the easiest thing to do, unlimited, unrestrained import of Soviet literature, Soviet journalists, uh, giving Soviet propaganda and ideological agitators equal time on American TV network, it has to be stopped. And it's easy. They won't, they won't be offended, mind you. As a matter of fact, they will respect America more. But when my former colleague Vladimir Posner appears on Nightline and Ted Koppel asks him, Well, Vladimir, what do you think about this? And that? What can he think? He is an instrument of propaganda. He thinks what, what, what Comrade Andropov tells him to think. <laughs> he is just a nice, articulate mouthpiece of the Soviet uh, uh, subversion system. And Ted Koppel makes you believe that my friend Vladimir Posner thinks <laughs> <laughs> the process of demoralization may not have started at all if at that point the country which is a recipient of subversion actively not violently but actively prevents importation of foreign ideology I don't want America to follow the pattern of ancient Japan. You don't have to shoot every foreigner when it approaches the sacred borders of the United States. But when he offers you a junk in the disguise of very shiny something, you have to tell him, no, we have our own junk. <laughs> At that point, the society is strong, brave, and conscientious enough to stop importation of ideas which are foreign. Then the whole chain of events could be prevented. Recently, I've been to the Philippines, and I was shocked how in big cities like Manila, children listen to deafening music. A melodious nation with long traditions of, of good, nice ethnic music introduced by Spanish long time ago, maybe two centuries, three centuries ago, I don't remember how long. All of a sudden listen to musical garbage, blasting their radios at, at full blast, at the, the full volume. Why? In India, I spent many years watching the reactions of Indians walking out of movie theaters after seeing Hollywood production. They, they couldn't figure out why Americans are so wasteful. They smash their cars, their shiny cars, every five minutes. How come they shoot each other for half million dollars? Is it true that they're so sex, sex uh, uh, I mean, obsessed with sex? Can you imagine showing a movie where each 
five minutes there's a copulation on the screen. So a country like India, with long traditions, tradition of, of uh, respect to, to this private matter, or to Pakistan. And United States expect these people to respect you? No way. Oh yes, they will see the movie, they'll pay five rupees to see that garbage. But they walk out and will tell their kids, don't respect Americans, don't be like Americans. See? So, the process of demoralization could be stopped right here, both as an expert and as an import. And that takes one step, one very important thing to do. You don't have to expel all the KGB agents from Washington, D.C. The most difficult and at the same time the simplest answer to the subversion is to start it here and even before. By bringing back the society to religion, something that you cannot touch and eat and put on yourself, but something that rules society and makes it move and preserve it, a Soviet scientist, Shafarevich, who has nothing to do with religion, he is a computer scientist, did a very intensive research <clears throat> on the history of socialist countries. He calls socialist or communist <clears throat> any country with a centralized economy and a pyramidal style of power structure. And he discovered, actually he didn't discover it, he just brought to attention of, of his readers, that civilizations like Mohenjo-Daro, in the river Hindus area, like Egypt, like Maya, Incas, like Babylonian culture, collapsed and disappeared from the surface of Earth. The moment they lost religion, as simple as that, they disintegrated. Nobody remembers about them anymore. Well, distantly. <clears throat> so, the ideas are uh, moving society and keeping mankind as a as, as society of human beings, intelligent, moral agents of God. The facts, the truth, the exact knowledge may not. All the sophisticated technology and computers will not prevent society from disintegrating and eventually dying out. Have you ever met a person who would sacrifice his life, freedom, for the truth like that. This is truth. I never met the person who said, this is truth and I'm ready to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> to defend the truth. Right? But millions sacrifice their life, freedom, comfort, everything for things like God. Like Jesus Christ, it's an honor. Some martyrs in, in the Soviet concentration camp died. And they died in peace, unlike those who shouted, long live Stalin, knowing perfectly well that he may not live long. <laughs> something which is, something which is not material, moves society and helps it to survive. And the other way around, the moment we turn into two by two is four and make it a guiding principle of our life, our existence, we die. Even though this is true and this we cannot prove, we only can feel and have faith in it. So the answer to ideological subversion, strangely enough, is very simple. You don't have to shoot people, you don't have to aim mi missiles and Pershings and cruise missiles at Andropov's headquarters. You simply have to have faith and prevent subversion. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. That's it. Thank you.
the basic methods are not that much different from activities of any public relation officer from any big company, say Coca-Cola, I bet. They have their own department of, person, of public relations and press relations. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose is different. If Coca-Cola wants to make profit and to sell more Coca-Cola to nations of the world, the Soviet Union, the ultimate purpose of the Soviet system is not to sell anything, least of all ideology, is to destroy the civilization on which uh, the affluence and freedom based and replace it with a system of total control over life of human beings the system of total exploitation that's the, the ultimate purpose Con uh, my specific measures which, which I was forced to do unwillingly of course but I had to do them just to promote myself further and further is uh, bribery, corruption uh, befriending politicians, members of parliament influential uh, scholars uh, members of civil service, businessmen. In other words, anyone who has any, um, anything to do with shaping of public opinion in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. Uh, that would include a long process which sometimes is unnoticeable to an average person. It's a long-term process which is called so, uh, uh, ideological subversion. It's unnoticeable as movement of a small hand of a clock. You know it's going around, but even if you watch it in intensely, you, you don't see the movement. The eventual result is uh, befriending these people and trying to get them involved in, in the activity in the interests of the Soviet foreign policy. The immediate impulse when I learned that the Soviet Embassy, Department of Research and Counter-Propaganda, of which I was a deputy chief, is engaged neither in research nor in counter-propaganda. It is department which is compiling information of private nature on individuals divided in two groups, good boys and bad boys. The sympathetic people were promoted in media and in public life uh, the people who were opposed to the Soviet foreign policy were blackwashed, blackmailed, and, and, and destroyed, first morally and, and sometimes physically too. Uh, understanding of what I was doing came to me when I, when I looked through a press release of United States Information Service describing an incident in a South Vietnamese city of Hue, captured by communists from Hanoi for, for 48 hours. Then it was recaptured by United States and South, South Vietnamese armies. And to their horror, they discovered that within two nights, the communists could manage to round up more than 15,000 people and execute them. Uh, most of these people were either sympathetic to United States or to the Western culture, or directly involved uh, in, in activities uh, uh, supporting the United States president in South Vietnam, agents of CIA naturally, even barbers because they know too much. They were executed and the United States intelligence couldn't figure out how could they possibly do it in such short period of time. Later on they discovered, uh, they found out from several defectors that long before communists occupied that city uh, there was an extensive omnipresent network of informers who knew exactly the addresses, the names, the whereabouts of each individual who was later executed. When I turned to my own files, I discovered that basically that information exists in my department. So it doesn't take much intelligence to understand what I was doing in India. I was compiling information. Comes revolution, these people would be executed. Indirectly, I was involved in, in, a, in a criminal activity, in, in mass murder. I decided to defect and explain it to Americans, and the uh, response I already described, I was called a paranoid. But I decided to defect and try nevertheless. This is another long story. It's virtually impossible to defect in India simply because Indian government under pressure from the Soviet government, if you can call them government, I don't call them government, I call them junta. Uh, they adopted a law as early as, as, as in 61 or 62, after, after Stalin's daughter defection especially. That law states that no embassy, no, no foreign uh, uh, legation on the territory of Indian Republic has the right to extend political asylum to any defector from any country, which is very 
it's, it's a masterpiece of hypocrisy. No other defector but a Soviet one needs a political asylum. Uh, if you are a Canadian or American, if you want to be nasty to your own government, the maximum you can do is just to pick up a phone and uh, make a dirty phone call to your ambassador. And buy yourself a ticket and get lost. <laughs> what, what happens to a Soviet defector in, under that law? If I knock a door of, of United States Embassy, by that law, the American diplomats have to turn me back to the Indian police, and Indian police takes me back directly back to the Soviet embassy. And that's the end of, of my uh, defection. So knowing that perfectly well, and having contacts both with Indian police and American uh, media corps, I, I understood that the only way for me was to disappear for a while. And the best way I discovered was to mix with a group of hippies. Mind you, that, that was the time <laughs> I, I was 13 years younger, so I looked slightly different, of course. I, I studied so-called counterculture in India. Uh, sometimes uh, good, sincere young people who wanted to study oriental mysticism and culture and religion but most of them were simply easygoing individuals who were delighted with exotic, exotic life and, and um, the easiness with which they can purchase hashish and, and other drugs in India. And sometimes they traveled Indian subcontinent without any identification papers. So the best way to, to uh, escape detection was to mix with the group of hippies and travel in India uh, until the campaign in the media and, and in the police, uh, the police search will subside. All the newspapers in India carried my picture and uh, announcement of the police uh, that anyone coming forward with information about my whereabouts would receive 5,000 or 2,000 rupees. Knowing that perfectly well, I just walked in there barefoot with beads and blue jeans, smoking hush and um, enjoying life until I found sympathetic journalists who smuggled me from India to Greece, mind you, that was a military dictatorship at that time. Then only I approached uh, American CIA and they helped me to uh, land in Canada as a legit, uh, ordinary uh, immigrant. So now I'm a Canadian citizen, as you can see from my patriotic type. <laughs> uh, Canada is a kind of middle-of-the-road uh, of the road country where uh, there are so many various ethnic groups that another uh, strange character who speaks both Russian and, and English and two Oriental languages, did, did, I, I, I didn't have any mm, problem uh, fitting into academic circles and first being just a student at the University of Toronto and later a producer with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. If it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There are obviously, in every society, there are people who are against the society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy, conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything. Right? All these movements will be directed in one direction. Right? This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. Okay? Obviously, there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? 
These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly, <clears throat> in case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it, replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded, education, distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, anything, as long as it takes you away, okay, uh, social life, replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people. Take away the responsibility. Power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected Never. As a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. Do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power, and yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that a policeman, an officer of the United States Army, looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, and he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. No? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. Millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving of wor uh, a worker's condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology to prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Pickets. Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination. The workers' right. And we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers' right. To reverse this process, do not elect them to the seats of power, whether it is municipality level, state level, or federal level. It has to be beaten in the heads of American voters that a person like that in the seats of power is an enemy. Do not be afraid of this word. It is an enemy. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. That's it. Thank you.